Welcome to Homeschool Nolan, here to help you navigate learning in the digital age. Last month, I had the opportunity to visit Taipei, Taiwan, a place I've actually visited many times since I was a child. And one place I visited again in Taipei was the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall. Now, if you know nothing about history, you might think just by looking at the memorial and the magnificent statue of Chiang Kai-shek, that Chiang Kai-shek must have been an outstanding military leader who won a great war or a revolutionary who founded a major country. When in fact, in reality, he was neither. When he died in 1975, he was largely remembered in the West as the man who lost China. But Taiwan has changed a lot in the last five decades since his death, and so have attitudes towards him. Earlier this year, a new biography of him was published titled Victorious in Defeat, which reflects the ambivalent feelings people now have towards Chiang Kai-shek. And in this video, I'd like to share some thoughts on why, after visiting Taiwan this year, Chiang Kai-shek still matters to both Taiwan and the world. But first, who was Chiang Kai-shek? Before there was a People's Republic of China as we know it today, there was the Republic of China. And Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek became the leader of this republic after its founder Sun Yat-sen died in 1925. When Sun died, his ruling nationalist party, the Kuomintang or KMT, had an uneasy alliance with the Chinese Communist Party. In 1927, Chiang launched what is known as the Shanghai Massacre, where he purged the KMT of communists. He would then spend the next two decades at war with the communists in China. This civil war was interrupted in the 1930s though, when Japan invaded China. And sadly for the Chinese people, Chiang's National Revolutionary Army, or NRA, was no match for the modern Japanese army. And Chiang always seemed more interested in saving the strength of his army for fighting the communists. This resulted in his army retreating from China's coastal cities, leaving millions of Chinese civilians defenseless against Japanese atrocities. The best thing though that happened to Chiang during the war was when Japan then attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor, which instantly made the United States China's ally against Japan. Now Chiang Kai-shek didn't speak any English, but his wife, Mei Ling Sung, better known as Madam Chiang Kai-shek, was educated in America and she spoke perfect English. She was the perfect ambassador and face of China to the Western world. In 1943, she made a hugely successful tour of the United States, which included a historical speech to a joint session of Congress where she appealed for more military aid for China. Largely because of her, Chiang Kai-shek was able to receive hundreds of millions of dollars in aid from the United States. But while he was receiving all this aid, U.S. military leaders were always frustrated that much of this aid was being wasted on an army that was corrupt and incompetent. And Chiang always made it clear that he was more interested in saving his strength to fight the communists rather than the Japanese. But after Japan was finally defeated in 1945, Chiang resumed his civil war against Mao Zedong and the communists. But despite starting with an over two to one advantage in men and material and being backed by the United States, Chiang's National Revolutionary Army suffered defeat after defeat against the more disciplined and motivated Red Army. Mao Zedong had the peasants on his side. Chiang supposedly had the cities and the wealthy on his side. But to add to his woes, hyperinflation then struck China's economy in the late 1940s. And this, combined with decay morale, and rampant corruption finally led to his defeat, forcing him to retreat to the island of Taiwan in 1949, where he would end up ruling over a much smaller Republic of China for the remainder of his life. Chiang Kai-shek died in 1975 at age 89, never realizing his dream of reconquering the mainland. He was succeeded by his son, Chiang Jingkuo, who, who also ruled the island as a dictator. But then an interesting thing happened. In the last few years of his life in the 1980s, Chiang Ching Kuo ended martial law, which had been in effect in Taiwan for 38 years. 
He also pardoned political dissidents and initiated Taiwan's peaceful transition into the full-fledged democracy that we know of today, where Chiang Kai-shek's ruling KMT party has now evolved into the opposition party. When I visited Taiwan last month, it definitely had a progressive vibe, very different from the authoritarian vibe I remember from my youth. I still remember visiting Taiwan as a child in the early 1980s, where KMT propaganda was everywhere, and we always had to stand for the anthem at the movie theater. When I visited the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Museum as a teenager in 1991, I remember the museum glorifying the Generalissimo as a great Chinese leader. But when I visited again last month, the exhibit on Chiang Kai-shek was noticeably much more subdued. In fact, they also added a human rights exhibit which reminds people that he was in fact a dictator who executed political opponents. Today, Taiwan just seems much more open with a vibrant gay community and where people always seem friendly to strangers. It was then that I realized that the Taiwan we know of today would not have been possible were it not for Chiang Kai-shek. Yes, he was a brutal dictator who crushed political dissent both in Taiwan and on the mainland. But he was not Mao Zedong. He did not launch a great leap forward which starred millions of his own people. He did not try to start a cultural revolution. Chiang Kai-shek, if he wanted to, could have sought asylum in the Philippines or even the United States after he was defeated. But instead, he chose to stay and defend what was left of the Republic of China in Taiwan. Because of that, Taiwan, until this day, has never been a part of the People's Republic of China. And that's why he still matters to everyone living in Taiwan today, as well as to anyone such as myself who is a child of immigrants from Taiwan. But beyond Taiwan, the victories and the defeat of Chiang Kai-shek still offer powerful lessons to the world today as the United States debates whether to send more military aid to another ally fighting a war within its borders. I'm of course referring to Ukraine. Now although Ukraine and China are very, two very different countries, Taiwan's fate today seems tied to whether or not Ukraine prevails. There are many who argue that if Ukraine loses its war with Russia, it will only embolden China to invade Taiwan and finish off the Republic of China once and for all. Chiang Kai-shek's life is a reminder to the world that not all dictators are equal, and sometimes the choice we have to make is not between a democracy and a dictatorship, but rather between a dictator and something worse. And I hope this video and the life of Chiang Kai-shek has helped you at least gain an appreciation of how our opinion of historical figures can change over time as they continue to make a difference in the world we live in today. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And don't forget to click subscribe for more videos like this one. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.